All right, so today we're going to continue the series on Chrome DevTools and talk about the console. Now, the console is a lot more than just the console.blog statement. And I know when I was starting out that, hey, I could write something out to the console with console.log. That was great, and it helped me with some very basic debugging. But there's a lot more that we can do with it. Now, one of the things that I talked about in a previous video was the different commands for opening up the, the dev tools once you have the console open. In here, in the elements, if I click on something inside the elements tab, over here, using dollar sign zero, gave me a reference to the last thing that I clicked on. And dollar sign one was the thing before that, dollar sign two before that, and so on. We also had the ability to do something that looked a lot like jQuery, where, hey, I want a reference to something on my page. Dollar sign is a method that I can call to get a reference to that element. So if you want to test things, we can use the console to do that. We can use the console to write basic JavaScript. So one plus one, there it is. Sorry about that. That was my dogs just having a conversation about who actually owns the toy. So back into the console. Basically, any JavaScript that you would write in your JavaScript file, you can write here. I can do fetch commands. I can do loops. Whatever it is, I can do it here. This is just a little JavaScript REPL. So in our VS Code JavaScript file for this web page that we've got loaded. So basic HTML, loading my CSS, my JavaScript. These are all the commands that I can use with the console. This is a shortcut that I use quite often. In my code, I'll make a shortcut for this so I can throw log commands in wherever I want. This is just a reference to the console.log method. So I only have to type log. Now I've got a an array here called data with a bunch of objects inside of it, just so I can reference that a little bit later. Uh, I've got a reference to an HTML element, and these are only here so I can use them as examples as part of this. So console.log, that's not a new one. We've got console.log, hello, and there it is. Writes it out in the console, nothing new there. Everybody knows that command. This command right here, the curly braces, what that one does is destructures, whatever you pass in. So when you put this and let's say I take my variable called data, what I'm actually doing is I'm saying, I would like you to console log out an object. And this object, and here, let me zoom in a little bit for you. This object is going to have a property called data. And that property is going to be called, is going to be whatever this value is. So it's this variable is a property in my brand new object that I'm console logging called data. So if I do that, there it is. Here's my object with the property data and inside of it is the array. We can open that up to take a look at all the bits and pieces inside. Now, the shorthand for doing this inside of an object, if you have a property and it's got a value, which is a variable, and they are the same name, you can just shorthand it like this. So. There we go. Same thing. My data variable is being written out. Just gives me an interactive object to work with. So that's those two. Now, this one is very similar to log. What it's basically doing though, let's say if I do console.dir and I pass in data, I'm going to have something, well here, I'll leave that one uncommented. Something that's very similar. What it does is it converts your variable into the JSON equivalent. So it converts it from JavaScript into JSON. So it's basically a big string, but it's still interactive. I can still see right here, the little I, it's interactive. So I can, here's the string and here's the interactive object. I can open it up, work with it the same way as doing this. So pretty close to the same thing, except here, I also get this label. So it can be useful if you're doing a whole bunch of console.log statements. If you wrap your variables inside the curly braces, it can help you track them down a lot faster when scanning through the log. Now, the one thing that you need to be careful of is this can only be one level deep. I can't, if I'm, I can't say, all right, I want the name property here. So inside the first object, I want to know what name is. 
this is going to complain. I can't do that unexpected token because remember, I was using the shorthand in here. To do that, I would have to add the data in front of it like this. There we go. Data is John. So that is the name inside the first object in the array. All right. So that is DIR. Remember, it's the JSON equivalent. And with the curly braces, we can sort of destructure our, uh, our object, or not, ob not destructure it, but we're turning it into an object that has a label so we can find it easily. Now, warn error info, these are all pretty much the same thing as console.log. So if I say error, this just gives me three different levels of information. And that means I can filter this. So verbose is everything. Info, I can hide the info messages. I can hide the warnings. So I only want the errors, but I can turn these on or I can say I want absolutely everything. So you can pick and choose the levels that you want. Or this panel right here also lets me do a quick filtering. So I can say, I just want the warnings. I just want the errors. I want that one warning inside of here. So we can pick and choose the things that we want in this side panel or from this drop down list. And there it is. So there's my console.warn, my console.error. This error warn info, that's just the text that I put inside there. Now, if it were an actual error object, that's fine. We can do that too. We can say new error. So here we have an error object being passed into console.error. And there we go. Error. This is an error object. And here's the text at here. There you go. You can see error message from the error object. Okay, so log error warn info dir wrapping it in the curly braces. Those ones are great for getting us some basic messages, just writing information out. Assert lets you test a message. So I only want to see the message if something went wrong. So if I do console.assert then what is it you're testing? And then what is the message or the object that you want to write out? Well, here, h2 and h2 dot, uh, well, let's do text content. So I will see nothing in my console for this because there's nothing wrong with that. This did exist, it had a value, and so this is what I'm gonna see. Now, if I put in something that is falsy, so false. Now, there it is. So this assertion failed. The test that I was trying to run failed. The result of this, so one plus one is two, which is a positive number, which is not zero. So therefore that's a true condition. So this will not show up. There we go. But one minus one, is zero. Zero is a falsy value, so I do get this right here. This is the text from inside of my h2 element. So the test failed, so therefore I see the messages. So this is something that you can use in your code. You can add console.asserts, and they'll only appear in the console if something fails, which can be a very useful tool. We have um, time and time end. So if you want to find out how long something is taking, let's do this. We can say console.time. Here's my starting time and I need a label for it. So my timer one. So this is my first timer. And then it will uncomment all these things. Once all of that is done, I'm going to do console.time end. So time and time end. Here's a starting point, here's an ending point, and we know it's the start and end of the same timer because we use that same label. You can create multiple timers, run them all, and you'll get times for all of them. And then here at the very bottom, there it is. This is how long it took, 0.43 milliseconds, to run all this code. So useful for performance. You want to test and see if things are actually running. This is a quick and easy way to do it. So there we go. Without having to do those other things, 
0.09 milliseconds. So that is our timers. Uh, table lets you take an object or an array, something that's multi-dimensional data, and turns it into a table display. That's a quick, easy one. We can take our data variable here. Let's do this console.table, and we'll pass data inside there. There we go. Nice, easy way to view all that data. Instead of having to open it up and drill down to find the stuff, we have it all displayed like this. Makes it quick and easy to see, and we can adjust it to read it easier, more easily. All right, so that's our table. We've got group. If you're going to have a collection of things, okay, I've got a something that I'm looping through. So let's do that. Let's comment out these times. We don't need those anymore. I'm going to run a loop. And I want to write out the name inside of each one of those objects. So inside of here, I'm going to loop through these objects and I'm going to write out the name. Fine. We can do that. There we go. There's the four names. But if I'm doing this with multiple arrays, multiple data sets, and I've got multiple collections, it might be nice to be able to group them together and fold them, close them down. So we can do that with group and group end. Right here, I can say console.group. Call it whatever you want, just like with the timer, you give it a name. And there's the end of it. And now it's indented, it has the label, and I can do this. I can open and close it. So if you had a hundred elements in that array that you were trying to loop through and make sure that this was working for all of your elements, there you go. There's a quick and easy way to do it. And if you want it collapsed like this at the very start, you would, instead of group, say group collapsed, and then by default, when it opens, it's, or when the, the page loads, this is going to be closed by default. All right. Um, trace. You want to see the trace stack. So I want to see what function called, what function called, what function to get to the point that I'm at right now. So we can do that. We'll say function. Here, I'll just write a quickly insert a couple of functions here. All right, so here's my stack of functions. I will call function one, which is going to call two, which is going to call three, which is going to write out the message. There we are inside three. So that worked. But if I wanted to know how did I get to that point when this command is running, we can use trace instead of log. And it gives us how we got to that point. There we go. Inside of three. So that's my console log statement done by the trace command. But the trace is also going to give me the information about how did I get to this point? Well, in the anonymous global scope, line 59, that's where this started. So line 59, sure enough, there was the, on the, in the global scope, on the main timeline, that was the function that was called. It called this on line 51, this function called this one, and then on line 54, function two called three, so line 54, function two called three, and then on line 57, we had the trace command being called by function three. So three called that, two called that command, one called that command, and then the initial call done here. And this is something that I haven't mentioned yet up until this point, but over here, you always get to know this is the file that made whatever this is happen. This is the, fi the, uh, the file that's running that talked to the console. And this is the line number. So you always have this information in the stack trace right here. You can see it as well. File and line number, file and line number. Sometimes you'll see two numbers that come after here. It'll give you a line number as well as a column number. So a position where in this big long thing, like the error happened right here or on line 45 at this point in my code. So line 45 at this point, this is where the error happened. 
So if you get two numbers, the second one is the column number. And last of all, let's say I put all these things back into our code. There we go. So we have all this code, but then the users clicked a button and instead of refreshing and having to worry about sorting through all this information to find the message that I really want, we can at any point in our code call console.clear. And I can type this in the console itself. I can click here to clear everything out. Or in our code, we call console.clear. There it is. Console was cleared. So the only thing that's showing up is just the table command right here. The only thing that we see is what comes after the clear. So I'm going to move this one up and uncomment it. So there's all we see now is just the table command that comes after the clear. So you can programmatically clear this out at some point in your code. If you know that you're going to have a ton of console messages that you want to get rid of, go ahead and do that. All right, and so that's it. That's all the awesome things that you can do with the console. I will have more videos in this series. I will be talking about breakpoints and log points and the sources panel and other panels. But for now, that's it. So hope that helps you out. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. A copy of this code is in a code just linked to in the description. And as always, thanks for watching.